good evening. You're watching the main news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Anne Reeson. And I'm Britton Clennett. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Unprecedented public backlash forces Macau leader to shelve bill, granting himself a generous pension package. MTRC admits Saing Pun Station won't be ready when West Island Line opens in December. Privacy Commissioner slams investment company for taking DNA samples from female staff to trace toilet blood stains. An unprecedented public backlash has forced Macau Chief Executive Fernando Choi to shelve a controversial bill that would have given him and his outgoing ministers cushy retirement benefits. Choi promised to learn his lesson as thousands who opposed the bill celebrated the first time the Macau government has made a U-turn because of public pressure. ATV's Emily Sue reports from Macau. Macau Chief Executive Fernando Cho announced a U-turn this morning, less than a week after the largest protest in the city since its return to China in 1999. An estimated 20,000 angry residents rallied on Sunday to demand the government scrap a controversial retirement package for Cho and his ministers. At least 7,000 people took part in another protest on Tuesday. Their message hit home, and this morning, Cho told reporters at Macau government headquarters that he was withdrawing the bill. He said a responsible government must face up to problems and realize when there are inadequacies in its proposals. Cho admitted that his administration could have done better explaining the bill and should have consulted the public. He promised to learn from the incident. We need to listen to people's opinions in order to narrow the differences and form consensus, Cho said. He added that he would officially instruct the Legislative Assembly to scrap the bill. On Sunday, thousands of protesters called for Choi to step down if he refused to shelve the bill, which they described as greedy and tailor-made for his administration, whose term ends on the 19th of December. Under the scrap proposal, which the government tabled without the involvement of lawmakers, a retired chief executive would receive a monthly payment amounting to 70 percent of his salary until he found a new paid job. Chair currently earns the equivalent of 262,000 Hong Kong dollars a month. The chief executive would also be granted immunity from criminal prosecution during his term of office. Senior government officials with a civil service background who retire will receive a one-off golden handshake amounting to 14 percent of their salary, while non-civil servants would get 30 percent. The contentious bill also proposed an additional monthly payment equivalent to 70 percent of the salary for outgoing officials for one year, the period they are barred from taking jobs in the private sector. After Sunday's mass rally, Cho delayed passage of the bill, but 7,000 people turned up outside the legislature on Tuesday, demanding that he abandon it altogether. People's power in solidarity. Online group Macau Conscience, which organized the protests, today accused the chief executive of dodging his responsibilities by not withdrawing the bill earlier. The group is warning that it's not over yet. The government is quite good at playing um, the tricks of, um, um, of the game of words. We don't want those tricks. We worry about the government uh, said in its press release and press conference that they uh, plan to launch a public consultation on a new version of the bill. We want more fundamental um, issues to be addressed in the upcoming public consultation if the government wishes to have one. With his five-year term ending in December, Choi has hinted that he'll run for re-election in a poll to be held after the 31st of August. But analysts are speculating that Beijing, worried by the unprecedented display of public discontent in the former Portuguese colony, may be considering an alternative candidate. And now that Macau has got a taste of what people power can achieve, the government is likely to face more public opposition to its policies. It may no longer be business as usual. Emily Su, ATV News, Macau. The trouble-plagued MTRC is facing another delay, this time on its West Island line, because a key station may not open until the first quarter of next year. That means even if the line opens on schedule at the end of this year, commuters travelling further west from Sheng Wan will have to skip the incomplete Saiyingpun station. ATV's winner Wong reports. 
Nearly five years after construction work began, people living between Shengwan and Kennedy Town have learned that the MTRC's West Island Line may not be fully operational in December as scheduled. That's because of stalled drilling work at Sai Ying Pun, one of three new stations. Transport officials said the foundations of residential buildings in the area have complicated construction work on exits near 1st Street and 2nd Street and a pedestrian tunnel near Keeling Lane. The reason we need all three entrances is to manage the, the passenger flow and the capacity of the station to get the passengers in and out and to avoid congestion. We need to be sure that we can evacuate the station safely um, in the required time and we need all three entrances to do that. But also, even some of the fundamental building services and the, the ventilation required in the station does actually require all three entrances. But work on the project as a whole is 90% complete, including overhead cable systems connecting Island West with the rest of the Island Line. Officials say Sai Ying Pun Station may not be finished until the first quarter of next year. If that's the case, the line will open as scheduled at the end of the year, but trains will bypass Sai Ying Pun until the station is completely ready. The West Island Line begins at Shengwan and goes on to Sai Ying Pun, Hong Kong University and Kennedy Town. The projected delay is the latest problem to hit the MTRC, which is under renewed fire despite announcing $500 million worth of sweeteners to soften a 3.6 percent fare increase starting next month. The latest setback means all of the railway operators' projects in the city are behind schedule. Last month, it admitted that the high-speed rail link to Guangzhou will be delayed by two years, triggering claims of a cover-up and prompting the government to set up a panel to investigate the costly fiasco. The discovery of ancient wells and historical relics at Tokwawan Station is affecting the construction of the Sha Tin to Central Link. Construction work at the West Island, South Island East and Kun Tong Line Extension is also running behind schedule. Winna Wong, ATV News. The Privacy Commissioner has slammed an investment company which took blood samples from female employees to find out who had dirtied the toilet with menstrual stains. The watchdog called it a shocking and outrageous violation of privacy laws. Privacy Commissioner Alan Chung revealed details of the draconian lengths a company went to in trying to find out who left menstrual blood stains in a female bathroom. The investment firm, which was not named, ordered all its female staff to give blood samples for DNA testing to catch the culprit. Chung said the company could have pursued less intrusive measures to avoid what he called an outrageous and shocking breach of privacy laws. Acting on complaints from staff, Chung's office issued an enforcement notice forcing the company to stop collecting samples and destroy existing ones. The privacy watchdog also had a warning about so-called blind recruitment advertisements. The ads ask for applicants' information without providing clear details of the employers or the advertisers. Listed and well-known organizations such as the football club and the professional teachers' union were among those using the tactic. The watchdog issued notices to 48 mainly small and medium-sized advertisers, which broke the rules by asking job seekers for information such as identity card or passport numbers. While the firms have been ordered to delete the data, there's no evidence to indicate any of it was misused. The Medical Council has been urged to speed up the handling of complaints after it took five years to reach a verdict in the case of a celebrity couple whose son died shortly after birth. A former president of the council believes increasing the number of non-professionals conducting inquiries would speed up the process. ATV's Arthur Akiola reports. On Sunday, the Medical Council found obstetrician Christine Choi guilty of professional misconduct in the 2005 death of the newborn baby son of actress Eugenia Lau and singer Peter Chung. The ruling came nine years after the baby's death and five years after the celebrity couple filed a complaint. Choi was dropped from the medical register for two years after the council found her guilty of inducing birth without the mother's consent and failing to give the newborn effective resuscitation. On a radio show today, Chung criticized the length of time it took to reach a conclusion. 
Former Council President Gabriel Choi, who is chairman of its preliminary investigation committee, explained that such cases take a long time as doctors appointed to the inquiries are normally very busy and it's difficult to work around their schedules. When the council holds an inquiry, either five members or three members and two assessors from outside the medical sector are appointed to the case. However, Choi pointed out that Hong Kong has only four non-medical assessors, which is not enough, and the number should be increased so the backlog of cases can be handled more efficiently. Choi also said if the assessors were allowed to take the place of doctors on the panel, the process could be speeded up. He also denied the couple's doctor had been let off with a slap on the wrist, pointing out that it's not guaranteed she'll be allowed to practice again when her suspension ends. Arthur Akiola, ETV News. Organizers of the June 4th candlelight vigil have called for unity after splinter groups said they plan to hold separate ceremonies outside Victoria Park. This comes as Occupy Central leaders say they're not conceding defeat yet, a day after vowing to apologize if fewer than 100,000 people take part in their de facto referendum next month. The civil disobedience group Occupy Central is organizing a referendum on political reform, months before the government rolls out its final blueprint for universal suffrage in the 2017 chief executive election. People above the age of 18 can take part in the Occupy vote, which runs for three days starting on the 20th of June. They will be asked to choose one of three shortlisted proposals at polling booths or online, and the winner will be endorsed by the movement. Occupy's core leaders said yesterday they would step down if fewer than 100,000 people turned up to vote in the de facto referendum. But today the organizers insisted they're not ready to concede defeat. Academic Chan Kin Man rejected suggestions that the whole campaign would be over if the vote target isn't met. We would apologize for the lack of leadership, but it's too early to decide on our next step. On a separate note, organizers of the annual candlelight vigil in Victoria Park are expecting a solid turnout this year, the 25th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square crackdown. In response to a plan by splinter groups who want to set up camp outside the venue, Alliance Chairman Li Chik Yan called for unity in order to send a powerful message to Beijing. Overseas, Australian officials have admitted that the Malaysian passenger plane, which disappeared in March, is not in the area they had identified. That means the massive search operation in the Indian Ocean, northwest of Perth, has been a waste of time, and it's back to square one. Using satellite data, officials had concluded that flight MH370 ended its journey in the Indian Ocean, northwest of the Australian city of Perth. But no trace of the plane with 239 people on board has been found and there's no explanation for its disappearance on the 8th of March as it flew from Beijing to Kuala Lumpur. Four pings that were believed to have come from the missing plane's black box flight recorders were heard by search teams. Based on those pings, the triangle of water in the Indian Ocean was identified as the prime area, and a lot of time, effort and money was spent there, including a search of the ocean floor by a submersible robot. But Australian officials admitted today that the area is not the last resting place of the missing Boeing 777, despite their Prime Minister telling the world about his confidence in locating the wreckage there. We concentrated the search in that area because the pings or the information we received was the best information available at the time. And that's all you can do in circumstances like this, to follow the very best leads. The statement came hours after a US Navy official revealed that the acoustic signals probably came from some other man-made source. Officials said efforts would now focus on reviewing search data, surveying the sea floor and bringing in specialist equipment. It's a hammer blow to the families of the mostly Chinese nationals who were on the plane. U.S. whistleblower Edward Snowden says he's never been in the pay of Russia and has not given Moscow any secrets after he was granted temporary asylum there. While the former national security contractor declared himself a patriot, America's top diplomat challenged him to return home to face trial. Here's Arthur Kiola. Edward Snowden is the man the U.S. government loves to hate. 
That's because he fled from his intelligence post in Hawaii last year with a horde of documents that exposed Washington's massive global cyber espionage program. The targets included Hong Kong and mainland China, which the U.S. has continuously blamed for cyber spying on America. In his first interview with a U.S. TV network, Snowden said he sacrificed a promising career to draw attention to what the National Security Agency was doing. The reality is the situation determined that this needed to be told to the public. You know, the Constitution of the United States has been violated on a massive scale. Snowden flew to Hong Kong in May last year and was in Moscow on his way to Central America the following month when Washington revoked his U.S. passport. He was given asylum for a year in Russia and says he may have to ask for an extension. Snowden insists that he has not received any money from Russia, never met President Vladimir Putin, and never given Moscow any secrets. Do you see yourself as a patriot? I do. But U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said patriots don't go to Russia. He urged Snowden to man up, put his trust in the American system of justice, and return home to face charges for leaking sensitive secrets. Snowden, Kerry charged, is a coward who has betrayed his country. We have evidence that people are in uh, additional danger because operational security has been breached, because terrorists have uh, learned firsthand about methods and mechanisms by which the United States collects intelligence. Uh, and so our, our operations have been compromised. It's plain and simple. If after a year, they can't show a single individual who's been harmed in any way by this reporting, is it really so grave? Is it really so serious? And can we really trust those claims without scrutinizing them? Snowden went on to accuse Washington of fear-mongering to justify its spying. While he admitted that he would like to return home, the fugitive said his biggest wish is for reform in U.S. intelligence gathering. His dramatic disclosures have forced and embarrassed Washington to make some changes. But leaders of allied countries and ordinary citizens around the world who have been victims of cyber snooping have demanded more transparency. Arthur Akiola, ATV News. More news from overseas. Egypt's former military chief who ousted the country's first freely elected president has won a crushing victory to become head of state. And Thailand's military rulers have defended their decision to seize power, claiming it would have been civil war otherwise. Here's Winner Wong. Thailand's generals have dismissed international criticisms and defended the coup they launched a week ago. A senior general said in the capital today that the military takeover was aimed at averting civil war. Bangkok might have become like Syria, Libya or Iraq, said General Chachalurm Chalurm Suk, the deputy army chief of staff. The ruling military council promised elections but gave no timetable. It is the council's intention to create the right conditions for national reconciliation and push forward the reform process in order to put Thailand on a path towards free and fair elections. General Prayuth Chanocha led the coup in a bid to end a political crisis triggered by six months of mass protests against Prime Minister Ying Lak Shinawat and her family. The demonstrations paralyzed Bangkok and threatened the economy, including the vital tourism sector. Supporters of Egypt's former military chief, Abdul Fattah al-Sisi, celebrated in Cairo as he swept to power in a presidential election. Sisi won 93 percent of the vote against 3 percent for his only rival, while the rest of the ballots were declared invalid. But the victory was not as overwhelming as the figure suggests. Voting had to be stretched over three days in a bid to lure more voters. In the end, turnout was only 44 percent. Many of the remaining 30 million voters apparently stayed away to protest against Sisi, who last year deposed Mohamed Morsi, Egypt's first freely elected president. A man believed to be the captain of a Japanese oil tanker is missing after an explosion on board. Seven other crew members were rescued. Three of them were injured. The tanker was not carried.